Hello my friends. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. If you're new here, I'm Lindy. I do read a lot, pretty much a book a day. So even though I did a recent reads a few days ago, I've got five more books to tell you about. All of them are four-star reads. So unlike how I usually do it, I'm not saving the best for last because I kind of feel the same way about all of them. Um, I do have a method to my order, but before I'm even going to tell you about those books, I thought I'd take a minute to talk about poetry. Way back in January, I started reading one poem a day from this fabulous collection. When the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through. And these are all Indigenous poets, mostly from the United States. And the collection is edited by Joy Harjo. <laughs> As you can see, I keep my little sticky tags handy here. But I'm about halfway through. This morning I did a different poetry thing. I got a comment from one of my subscribers, James Holder. He has a booktube channel uh, as well. He reads a lot of nonfiction and uh, manga, if you're interested. Uh, of course, I will have his channel linked below. And James mentioned in a comment to me that he hadn't been happy with the poetry books that he had picked up recently. And so I said with some hubris, uh, what are your favorite poets? Maybe I can recommend something for you. Well, the reason I say I had hubris is because the four poets that he says are his favorites, none of them I had read their poetry before. So this required some reading and research on my part, and it was very enjoyable. This morning I read four or five poems online from each of these four poets. They are Catherine W. Carter, Austin Smith, Evie Shockley, and Nate Klug. And what I found was a common denominator for all these poets is that they use a very lyric style. Nate Klug, for example, writes a lot about nature and urban landscapes and creates word pictures. Uh, there's a very uh, Christian influence. So I thought immediately of Mary Oliver. I'm guessing James Holder is already familiar with Mary Oliver, but in case you're not, maybe pick up West Wind. I think that you will really enjoy her poems. And Mary Oliver is a poet I can turn to again and again and again. So if I'm feeling kind of disappointed or like new stuff isn't grabbing me, sometimes what I need to do is go back to my favorites and that might work for you too, James. Now Evie Shockley, in addition to uh, writing a lot about family ties and socio-political concerns has some ele elements of myth in her poems and the first poet I thought of was Nikki Finney and the collection of hers that I recommend is called Head Off and Split. Uh, give that one a try maybe. It is absolutely delightful. Austin Smith, again, is documenting small moments. Um, there's a lot of nostalgia in his poetry. Catherine W. Carter is uh, doing that same thing with finding meaning, um, interconnectedness, and all four of these poets are writing about the experience of noticing, paying attention. And so I have some more poets to recommend. Jory Graham's Sea Change. That one 
especially for the interconnections that she's writing about and also the tensions between spirit and flesh. Uh, that might work for you. And if you are particularly looking for new to you poets, I've got three Canadians to recommend. I'll start with Kai Kello and his collection Magnetic Equator. There's lots about landscape in here and travel. Some of the poems that I read of Nate Klug's had to do with travel and landscape. The social political elements of Evie Shockley's work are in here. Family ties, those kinds of those kinds of things. Yeah, I think you might like this. And Alice Major, uh, probably any of her collections, but I particularly recommend Welcome to the Anthropocene. Again, lyrical, small moments, but also the larger picture of our place in the world, social political concerns, and just superb wordsmithing. And lastly, Michael Crummy's Under the Keel. I did have a copy of his book, but I think I gave it away. <laughs> I tend to do that. Uh, his vocabulary is vast, and he writes about small moments, family ties, uh, landscape, all easy to connect to, but also uh, just exquisitely done. So James, these are just a few suggestions. If any of them catch your interest, I hope that you'll let me know what you think after you read them. And if anybody else has suggestions for James, especially if you've read his favorite poets, I'll put them up here again. Catherine W. Carter, Austin Smith, Evie Shockley, and Nate Klug. And you have recommendations for poets who have a similar style, similar content. Put those suggestions down in the comments below. I'd appreciate it. And I have one more suggestion for poetry in general, and that is the podcast, Poetry Unbound. It's a 15-minute podcast. If you want to make time for poetry in your day, this is a suggestion. So what Padre Gotuma does, he reads a, one poem and then he talks about it, especially what he appreciates about it and what connections that he makes with it. And then he reads the poem again. It's a nice, calm, relaxing way to experience poetry. And this book is a collection of his writings, uh, 50 Poems to Open Your World. If you want to develop your appreciation and awareness of what it is about poems that you connect with, try this book or try the podcast. And above all, poetry is to be enjoyed not to be dissected and criticized. Poetry is close to my heart and I love Poetry Month, so I thought I'd just do a little bit about poetry before I get into the books that I've finished. I haven't finished this one, by the way. I'm just dipping in and out. Okay, now I'm going to go on to what I have finished reading, starting with an audiobook that I listened to for People April, and I'm talking about the five, The Untold Lives of the Women Killed by Jack the Ripper, and it's by Hallie Rubenhold. The audiobook is read by Louise Breezley. I mentioned People April in my last video, but I forgot to say the names of the hosts. 
Elizabeth of Bouquins and Books and Roz of Scally Dandling about the books. Of course, I will link their channels down below. We've still got another 10 days to go in April, so it's not too late if you want to join in on the group read. This is, as the title suggests, uh, it's about the women who were killed in the Whitechapel murders. So this was in the 1880s in London, and it's a larger picture of the society, Victorian society. So if you're interested in reading Victorian literature, I think this is a good pairing for um, you know, facts about life during that time. The author goes into great detail about things like what it was like to be in a poor house and lodging houses, um, why people were sleeping on the streets, problems of alcohol addiction, that sort of thing. I found it very, very sad. These, these women and so many others had such tragic lives, uh, struggling in poverty. So it would also be a good book for Miserable May these five women in particular, Annie, Polly, Kate, Mary Jane, and Elizabeth, it was like they had the cards stacked against them right from the time that they were born because they were born women and they were born poor. So they were considered less important than their brothers, uh, they would never earn as much as men, and so their education was considered less important. Uh, the best thing that they could aspire to was life in domestic service, not emotionally fulfilling work. Elizabeth actually was born in Sweden, and there's an excerpt that I transcribed from the viewpoint of this Swedish art historian. Henrik Carnell, who was reflecting back on his childhood, and he recalled a middle-class wife who busied her bored, underemployed maids by making them carry wet linen through the rooms in order to catch the dust before it settled. Uh, yeah, talk about make work. There are things like the specialized vocabulary of the tin working trade that I found interesting. While Hallie Rubenhold's writing style is not quite to my taste, sometimes a bit too dry, sometimes a bit overwrought, I did really appreciate how detailed her descriptions were. And I think the section of the book that I appreciated the most was the conclusion where the author talks about how attitudes towards what are considered good women and bad women persist to this day and that there's an acceptable standard for women's behavior and those who deviate from it deserve to be punished and that there's a ripperology community which elevates the status of the murderer to that of celebrity and, as she puts it, confers favor on his victims because they got intimate with one of the most famous men on earth. And how disgusting is that? Anyway, I'm really glad to have read this book, and I look forward to seeing comments from other readers who are participating in this group read. Next up, I have a new Canadian novel by C.S. Richardson, All the Color in the World. And it's a life of a scrawny man born in 1916, Henry, who loved art, he was raised by his Irish grandmother who bought him pencil crayons, 
There's a lot of descriptions of art materials and colors. Uh, he became an art historian and then went off to war, which affected his mental health for the rest of his life. Mental Health May is coming up. If you are interested in soldiers and how war affects the psyche, I do suggest this, whether it's called shell shock or combat stress or battle fatigue, war takes its toll on soldiers and some more than others. Henry came back damaged, recovered enough to go back to work at university teaching art history. It's written in vignettes in second person and I'm going to read you just a little passage to give you a flavor. May 1945. Classes cancelled. You weave your way through the cr student crowds, waving their Germany surrenders headlines and Union Jacks. All is sunshine, trees budding, reserve give giving way to release. There's dancing in the quad, kissing strangers, impromptu songs. I'm waiting, soldier boy. There may even be a bounce in your step. After all, you have kept calm, carried on survived. Yet the more you reassure yourself, the blacker the dog. It arrives without warning, anytime, anywhere, callous, cruel. Only the tells are dependable, cold sweat in the small of your back, stomach butterflies turning to cramps, breathing shallowing to a wheeze. Soon enough the vice grips your chest, the hammer splits your forehead, the desperation that there is nowhere to hide, that someone will notice, the visions, the terrors, colorless, beginning as dull sepia, only to drain to blacks and whites. There are no lively pastels to divert your attention, no comforting hues, all is blinding glare and unnerving shadow. If you love books that focus on one character and their internal experience, this book is for you. Next up, I have three queer graphic novels, starting with this one from France, Thieves by Lucy Brion, and it's translated by the author into English. It's the story of a couple of high school girls, Ella and Madeline, and it's a story of kleptomania and dealing with the dark side of people that we love. It's mostly black and white with one additional color. Occasionally, there are um, more colors on a page. And here's one example that made me smile that was about the language difference between French and English because in French, hair, cheveux, is plural and in English, singular. And so that's where this mistake originates. Ella is describing her first love to Madeleine. Marcel, he had a red plastic shovel and long blonde hair. He let me braid them every recess. It was real love. And one day he had a buzz cut. It's romantic, funny, cute, light, uh, with some depth, uh, suitable for YA and up. And these last two graphic novels are both by Australian cartoonists. The first one is by Sass Millage and it's called Memo. The landscape scenery in this graphic novel is outstanding. So, so gorgeous. This is the opening page, really sets the scene. You see the little town of Hairsden in the background 
and one of the two central characters, a couple of lesbians that are in their teens. Joe is the one on the bike. She's gone to find a witch who is new in town, Orla. Orla's living the van life. <laughs> I had to smile at this because one of my nieces is currently what, living what she calls the van life. Traveling around just in her van, sleeping in her van. And as you can see in this page, a lot of the emotion is portrayed with facial expression. She keeps the dialogue down to a minimum. There's attraction right from the start between Joe and Orla. Are you the witch? That depends on who you ask. I'm asking you. I am a witch, yes. Great, I'm Joe Manalo. I need your help. Well, Joe, I'm afraid I'm not open for business today. She did manage to get Orla to give her a hand. Uh, they've got a problem with a poltergeist in their attic that she hopes Orla can help them out with. And as they're walking through the forest, I spotted a currawong and a fairy hen, and I think that's a bellbird. Definitely Australian birds. So I know this is influenced by Australia. The author grew up on the southeast coast. Uh -uh. Another fun romantic story with fabulous, fabulous art. And when I was getting more information about Sass Millage, I saw that in an interview she did online, she recommended another queer witchy story by an Australian cartoonist, and that is called Witchy. It's by Ariel Slamet Reese, who has Asian heritage, including Muslim Indonesian on, in her family heritage. And this story is set in a fantasy world that is very pan-Asian in its depiction. It's an archipelago called Hyalin, and our central character is Nynaeve. You can see her here getting ready for school. There's her little alarm clock, <laughs> the little bird. A tap on the head seems to be hitting snooze. So in this world, how much magic you have depends on how long your hair is. So length of hair doesn't matter between boys or girls, it's just hair, so the whole politics of hair. But if your hair is too long and you're too powerful, you might be killed for it. And that is what's happened to Nynaeve's father. So she uses magic to make it look like her hair is not as long as it is. One of her classmates is trans, Prill, and she is a great character too. I'm like, most of the central characters are queer in this book. There's a scene of Prill demonstrating her control over magic at school. Here we see Nynaeve again with her hair cut off for reasons, and she mistakes a raven for uh, a lackey of the kingdom. Well, not all ravens. Look, I don't trust ravens on a good day, especially not talking ones. Thank you for saving me, but I have to go. And that's not the end of the interaction between these two. For the rest of this volume, Nynaeve and this raven are going to be like this. The story continues. I've only read the first volume so far, but last year volume two was published and I'm looking forward to continuing and finding out what's next. So there you have it. That's what I finished lately. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate hearing from you. So please leave me comments down below and just say hi if you don't know what else to say. Uh, 
I have a little witchy thing that I made that I'll add in a little clip at the end if you want to hang around for that. Thanks again. Bye for now and I'll see you in the next one. There's a little witch that I made oh, decades ago. I'm glad that I kept one. Most of them I sold at a craft fair. I used to do such things. And this one is called Triple Happiness. And you can see that she's got feather for hair. And yeah, makes me happy when I see her hanging here in my bedroom.